Hello everyone, my name is Janet Forrest and I am one of the adult programs coordinators at the Nantucket Athenaeum. Thanks for being here tonight for our Yummy Monday. And tonight we're gonna to be speaking to, actually he'll be speaking to us, is uh, Chef Ganem Jacob. And he's gonna be showing us tonight how to make kimchi and uh, what it is and um, all about it. And without any further ado, I'll um, turn things over to Ganem. So welcome Ganem. Thank you, Janet. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my kitchen. Um, today, I'm going to show a little demonstration on how to make um, Korean kimchi. Kimchi is the staple food of Korea, eaten at almost every meal. Um, kimchi literally means soaked vegetables. And in this case, soaked is equivalent to what we would say pickled. Um, there are a few steps involved. It's very simple. Um, a lot of passive time, not a lot of active time in preparing this recipe. And it can be made with just about anything, um, anything that you'd like to pickle. Cucumbers, peppers, bamboo shoots, bean sprouts, almost anything that grows in your garden, you, you can make a kimchi out of, and in Korea they often do. This is a traditional way of preserving the uh, vegetable harvest over the winter. So, the vegetables we prepared, salted to extract excess water and to aid in preservation. Then generally they are seasoned and buried in the backyard in a traditional uh, kimchi pot. It's made of earthenware, usually of some kind. Um, today we'll do it just slightly differently, a more, more uh, urban version for those of us who don't have backyards. Um, the fermentation process will convert the vegetables in such a way that not only do they preserve themselves, but they also add um, flavor benefits and um, health benefits. Like, like fermentation in wine, um, what happens is natural yeast that's in the air will feed upon the ingredients that are in the kimchi, converting them to alcohol and carbon dioxide. The alcohol eventually also becomes vinegar and the carbon dioxide when when stored in a certain way if there's somewhat of a seal not not completely airtight but enough pressure on the seal the kimchi will actually effervesce and so if you buy kimchi in the store you'll notice there is sort of a one-way valve so that if the pressure builds in the container Air can be released, but air does not get into effect the fermentation process or the or the freshness um, or the quality of, of the kimchi. So, one of the most common and most recognizable versions of kimchi is made with napa cabbage, daikon radish, and seasoned with. I've got some sesame seed, some Korean chili flake. This is a very mild uh, chili flake. Unlike Italian you know, crushed peppers, there are no seeds in it. And the hull, which is you know, dried and, and sort of crumbled in here, um, is, not, is not super hot. It's got a nice sort of mildish, slow kind of uh, sensation. And it's, it's kind of the equivalent. There are some probably varieties from Central America, or Mexico that are similar. And Aleppo pepper from Syria and that region is also very similar. Um, so these are not very expensive. You can, this bag is probably, I don't know, eight bucks, something like that. And it, it goes along, it goes a long way. And Ganem, are those hard to find? Like where about would, whereabouts would you find those? For people on Nantucket, I think the first stop could be, um, Nantucket Seafoods on Old South Road. They carry quite a few uh, Asian ingredients. Um, I know they, this is where, that's where I got the daikon. Um, I think I bought these at an Asian market off island on my way up uh, this spring. But you can certainly buy them online and just about any Asian market, I don't think you'd find them at a traditional American grocery, unfortunately. Um, but 
you certainly can find them. And if you really needed to, you could substitute another, another type of pepper. You could use even just a lot of paprika and a little bit of cayenne to sort of mimic that same sort of non-spicy pepperiness plus the spiciness of the cayenne. Um, that would be a, an okay substitute and just kind of test out the ratio to see what you, know, see what you like and depends on how spicy you like them. Uh, we also have some fish sauce. Traditionally, uh, some sort of salted seafood goes into the kimchi as well. And that could be salted fish or could be salted shrimp, just some sort of cured, cured seafood generally. Um, in this case, the fish sauce is made from salted anchovies. So it's a very, very easy thing to find and very, uh, very natural substitute for salted fish. Um, then I've got some Himalayan salt. These are the sesame and chili flake. I've prepared some things ahead of time so you don't have to watch me chop uh, too much. And this is a bit of a, for lighting and uh, focus purposes, I've elevated a, a workspace. It's a little awkward to work on, but bear with me. Gainum's actually like 6162. <laughs> He's not four feet tall. Like <laughs> Six eight in my heels. <laughs> um, so let's start with the nep cabbage. Uh, a more traditional way of, of preparing the cabbage is to cut it lengthwise. Well, I'm going to do something first. Let me show you something fun. What I do is I take off the bottom and Maybe I'd even shave this a little bit first. Maybe cut toward yourself. So giving sort of a fresh cut to the bottom, you could put this in a bowl of water and it will develop roots and it will sprout more Napa cabbage from the center. So often when I buy a cabbage or a boy, and you can even do it with celery, I just sprout a new head um, just for fun. And then I wind up using using it much later. So traditionally, um, people would cut the cabbage lengthwise into quarters. And between the leaves, you would sort of stuff what's called a slurry, which is a mixture of the ingredients that we're gonna to put together later. Um, and then these would be, once they're salted, they wilt and they become very pliable and easy to, to manipulate. These would be stored and stacked in a very uh, efficient sort of compact way in a pot. So there's no air between them. Um, and that's how they would ferment and store. And then they would pull them out you know, a piece at a time, chop them up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the way I use kimchi is not to use a ton of it at a time. So what I prefer to do is after I've lopped off the bottom, the leaves separate very easily. So I kind of stack them up and cut them in such a way that they're easy to get out of the container after they've fermented. And I can just use a spoon and scoop up how much kimchi I'd like instead of having to pull out a whole head and um, monkey with that on a cutting board. And about an inch long, half an inch wide. It's about the, te the texture, the consistency that I like. So I stack up the leaves, make a lengthwise slit or two. And then across. Because I've done some prep work, this is going to just be a step-by-step, -step, not using necessarily the proper ratio of ingredients. Um, I like to use a salad spinner to salt the kimchi. The bowls tend to be a large vessel, which is handy because a large volume of Napa cabbage, when it's salted, will wilt into probably 50% with volume. So. 
let's do this half. And this will be a handy, uh, a handy method, and you'll see why in a minute. So, usually I'm too tall for the table. I'm never, never too short. everywhere. Okay. You may have noticed also that I did not wash the um, Napa cabbage before cutting it, and that is because it's such a tightly bound head that it's really difficult to get toward the base and wash out any, you know, grit or sand or soil particulates that may be down there. So I like to wash it afterward. Um, and it's okay to wash your daikon as well at the same time. I've peeled a bit of daikon. That's this guy right here. Um, and we'll just chop this into sort of more bite-sized pieces. Don't try this at home. Slow down. <laughs> I was thinking I should have tried this earlier. <laughs> Get used to the angle. Okay, so into the vessel they go. And what I'm going to do is fill this with water, swish it around. I'm sorry, this will be off camera. Um, and then I'll pour it through the strainer basket to rinse it, to you know, remove the water. Then pour it back from the basket into the vessel for salting. Stand by. I put this in the chat, but if anyone has questions um, or comments or thoughts, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask and just kind of jump in, or you can um, put it in the chat and ask Anna any questions you might have. And uh, for those of you who joined just a few minutes late, I am recording the session. So you'll be able to watch it on our the Nantucket Athenaeum YouTube channel. Um, I'll probably have it up tomorrow so you can watch it then. Okay, so that's thoroughly rinsed back into the bowl portion of the salad spinner. And that, the contents are a little bit wet, is actually going to help us. It's going to help the salt kind of dissolve more quickly onto the, onto the leaves, which will make them activate more quickly, wilting and brining our ingredients. So a head of daikon, roughly five or six pounds. Um, it may take two if you have small heads. Um, about a pound of, sorry, Napa cabbage, five to six pounds. A pound of daikon radish. Um, and then we'll use about a quarter cup of salt. And I'm not going to measure. I have a fair enough money for this type of thing. And not everything in life is exact. So. You're using Himalayan salt. Does it matter what kind of salt you use? I think just not iodized is preferred. I think there, there, there is sort of a notion that iodized salt will lend a little bit of bitterness to it, which we don't want. Um, but certainly kosher salt, uh, sea salt, any of, the, any of the above, the things that are the minimally processed it tends to be helpful in just about everything. Um, and this, there are impurities in Himalayan salt. I think it's uh, iron oxide. And so when you dissolve Himalayan salt, you often find sort of a pink residue at the bottom of, of, the, bottom of the liquid. 
and this is going to be kind of self-rinsing because it's going to draw water out of the out of the leaves and then when we drain it again and all those kind of um, impurities just leave the, leave the bowl. So uh, give it a quick toss just to kind of evenly disperse the salt around the vegetables, the leaves. And over the course of an hour or two, the liquid's gonna draw out, it's gonna collect in the bottom, and the contents toward the bottom are going to be more heavily salted than the contents at the top because they will have rinsed themselves of, of the salt. So often I'll start this, go do something else for half an hour, come back, give another quick toss to kind of get that salty water more evenly dispersed over everything again. Then after, after another half hour or so, I'll come back and just drain it again over the sink into the basket portion of the salad spinner, basket into the salad spinner, and spin away. Through the magic of Zoom television, I happen to have some spun napa leaves and daikon. So I started this earlier today, let the salt do its magic. And as you can see, the, the, close up this, the leaves are soft and pliable. I hope you can see that. And they're resting upon themselves densely. So they're, they've become very wilted. And for simplicity, I like to just mix my kimchi right Finish the recipe right in this big bowl. It's very handy. Now you could use, um, you could add bok choy, you could, I think in a pinch, you could probably use savoy cabbage. I'm curious to try it with Brussels sprouts. I think that might be kind of neat as far as presentation. Um, but it's, it's a very versatile preparation. Like I said, almost, almost any vegetable. And you see it in, in Korea in a wide variety of, wide variety of forms. So. Let's make our slurry, which will have the Korean chili flake, about, uh, about a quarter cup for half a head. About the same amount in sesame seed. Uh, I use toasted sesame seeds. Then we have some pre grated well, pre because I did it earlier, but grated garlic, ginger, and sliced scallion. strictly for demonstration purposes, so I have more, more scallion below. And then we add our fish sauce. And for half a head, I would use about an ounce of fish sauce. The cabbage will already be fairly salty, but this tends to be a pretty salty dish, so um, a little more, a little less, depending on how salty you like it. I've tried putting toasted sesame oil in this as well, uh, just for more sesame flavor, but I think that might inhibit some of the fermentation. 
So lately I've just been drizzling a little sesame oil on top when I serve it. In Korea, traditionally, they would also add um, glutinous rice powder or ground, ground rice. And that is sort of something extra for the yeast to eat and become more active and thus reproduce and move the fermentation process along uh, more quickly and perhaps more steadily. I don't use it in mine because I don't think it, don't think it needs it. But I think it would probably uh, aid the consistency a little bit in that whatever liquid forms or is extracted from the vegetables during fermentation, the glutinous rice powder, because it's a little starchy, might have a tendency to make it more viscous and therefore coat each leaf a little more um, for service. Let's see. Okay, so we're just going to give this a mix. At this point, this is kimchi. There's, I'm sorry I can't pronounce the, the Korean names, but there is a name for unfermented kimchi, fresh kimchi, which is what this is. And at this point, we would put it in the pot, the ceramic pot that our grandmother gave us, buried in the yard. And after two weeks, we'd start eating it, it would be fermented, and it would last for months. Um, instead of bearing mine, I like to put it in my family heirloom kimchi pot, which had coconut oil in it when I bought it. Um, it has a, it's plastic, it's large, and it has a screw top lid. I, there's not a valve in it like in a traditional, um, or like when you buy a plastic one at the store, a full of kimchi. But if you scoop it on just enough so it seats around the top of the jar, but isn't tight, it will allow the air inside to expand because the carbon dioxide created during fermentation is going to cause the vessel to expand, which is one reason why I wouldn't want to use glass unless you had some sort of valve at the top because it, it could burst the vessel. Um, but this just loosely seated, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but it will start to effervesce. Is it showing? Perhaps not. Um, yeah, it'll... Just a little bit. Okay. A little bit of bubbles, right? Yes. Um, which is again part of the byproduct of fermentation, kind of like champagne um, or beer. The fermentation. Again, not just as a preservative, but also there are health benefits. It, um, it synthesizes vitamin B vitamins that help to free nutrients from vegetables and sort of aid in digestion. There are microbes that act as an antioxidant versus undesirable microbes in the GI tract. And the taste, it's, it has something that's undescribable that you, you don't get without fermentation. It's this, this deep, deep background flavor, as well as the saltiness, the spiciness. Um, the alcohol converts to vinegar. Not all of it, but most of it converts to vinegar, and then it becomes you know, sour, tangy. Um, and it's spicy, which opens your pores, raises endorphins. Um, I've heard it causes you to burn more calories, you know, to increase your metabolism. Um, and because it's a slow process, traditionally, 
over the course of fermentation, the taste will vary, the color will vary, um, the microbial activity will vary, and it becomes a bit more and more effervescent up until a point, and then at some point, there's no more oxygen in the vessel, and it stops, it stops fermenting further. And at some point, the effervescence probably, you know, dissipates, and you're left still with kimchi. Um, but there are, if you make this often, or make a big batch and eat it often, you'll notice the flavors evolve, and you'll notice the texture evolve, uh, which I think is kind of neat. I think it's kind of fun. Um, and it's another reason why, in this recipe especially, I don't really get hung up on, on measurements because just as one neighbor's recipe would differ from another's neighbor, another neighbor's recipe, um, because it's a evolving flavor, I think it stands to reason that there is no actual, this is what traditional kimchi should taste like. Mm. So it's a very forgiving dish in that way. Um, where we might traditionally serve it, as I said, in Korea, eaten at almost every meal. As a side dish, especially to things that are either uh, very rich or sort of starchy and mild, it, it's a very nice contrast to the richness. It sort of cleanses the palate between bites, let's say. Um, for something mild, it sort of complements and you know, adds, adds some excitement to the taste. Uh, and you could really use it anywhere that would, you would put a pickle or sauerkraut. It's very much Asian sauerkraut in the way that sauerkraut is European kimchi. Um, you'd see it in, in simple broth soups. And in the U.S., it, you know, as popularity is gaining and gaining, you see it used as a condiment, um, often pureed or chopped on, you know, see it on, on hot dogs, on tacos. Burgers, burritos, you see it more and more. I'm, I'm really curious to try it uh, on a Reuben sandwich instead of sauerkraut. I think that's it's calling me at this point. Um, I'm gonna show you another version, something I call kimchi, because I like the colors that are in kimchi and the, Fermentation causes it to fade. So I'm gonna make another little, another little concoction, which will be to emulate the um, what happens in the kimchi pot. So a little fish sauce. Sesame. Chili flake. And because there's no, not going to be any uh, fermentation happening, I'm going to add vinegar. This is just distilled white. You could use you know, apple cider would be perfect. Um, rice vinegar would be great. Anything that's not too committal, like raspberry vinegar or something, would be fine. Balsamic's probably a bit much. And because alcohol is formed during the fermentation process, that. just a tiny splash of vodka is going to simulate that part of the flavor. I haven't yet tried adding um, any sparkling water to give it that effervescent feel, but I'm worried that will dilute the flavors. So, giving that a pass for now. And earlier today, I diced some traditional radishes. Well, I don't know if they're traditional, but they're what we most find in our supermarkets. Let's call it a regular radish. I diced some cucumber, some chive, a red jalapeno, some red onion. And I'm going to add that 
to my little mock slurry with some ginger and garlic. Sorry, no garlic, just ginger. I'll tell you why in a minute. So this is going to be sort of a, a petite version of kimchi. I've taken some of these ingredients and salted them earlier. Salting really sets the color. Um, when you pickle something in just salt, or if you blanch something and you add a lot of salt to the water, it, uh, it sets the color very deeply. And then vinegar tends to fade the color, so the greens will turn grayish, and the radishes will fade to pink um, if they sit in the vinegar for too long. So I like to kind of make this in two parts and then sort of toss them just before serving them. And for this one, I'm going to add a little sesame oil as well. Because I'm not worried about it uh, inhibiting fermentation. Just a little drizzle. Now I'm going to put this to the side. We're going to make some, a couple little, just, this is just sort of a little hors d'oeuvre idea. Um, deviled eggs with sort of a Korean style barbecue bacon and some kimchi, some little petite kimchi. And then I'm going to show you, uh, just use this little petite kimchi as a mignonette on some oysters. So here I have bacon, you've all seen bacon. And I'm going to take, this is called uh, gochujang, which is a Korean paste of similar chilies, the chili, chili flake that I showed you, and glutinous rice powder. It, it's blended in such a way that it becomes very, let's see the lighting in this, very thick and it's another thing that's used sort of across all Korean cooking. It's in bulgogi, it's used as a condiment. Very, very ubiquitous item in a Korean kitchen. And I'm just gonna mix that 50-50 with some honey. Honey's gonna sweeten it up, of course, and it also, thankfully, makes it more spreadable. Onto the bacon we go. A little toasted sesame. And I would bake this at 350. Surely I do it on a sheet pan. I don't have a beautiful sheet pan to put on television, so I'm just showing the one slice. Um, 350, I usually use parchment paper on a sheet pan and do it in the oven. The bacon just tends to cook more evenly in the oven. And uh, on convection, if you have convection, 350. Now, magically, I have some done already. It comes out, you know, this is something that people call bacon jerky. You know, they might drizzle maple syrup and brown sugar um, or slow cook any thin strip of meat that's been salted like the bacon already has and then sugared. Uh, slightly cooked, remove the moisture, you have jerky. Um, because bacon is a smoked product, it's highly seasoned. When you add something sweet to it and something tangy and a little spicy, 
to me it has a very barbecue flavor. So this is a very quick way to make sort of a mock Korean barbecue pork. That's what I've done here. And I've got some, <clears throat> earlier today I boiled some eggs. I cut them across so they stand up rather than lie flat like a boat. I just put some scallions in this dish so they don't roll around and slide. So of course eggs are rich. They're not a very strong flavor though. So something with some spice, something with some tang uh, complements them really well. So let me just give this a little mix. So I would wait to mix this until just before I was serving so that the color stays in the radish and in the cucumber and the chai. If this were to sit for I don't know, half an hour, you'd really see it start to fade and the colors start to run. Um, the peppers hold their color, but everything else in here would really, really fade. I left a little divot in the center of each egg so the kimchi has somewhere to gather. I think this is, um, you know, deviled eggs, of course, are pretty, pretty popular. We've made kind of a, a real comeback in recent years. And this is, I think, kind of a fun way to liven them up, make them a bit more, more unique. And you can really, jazz up the presentation here. In a very simple way. Um, when I make kimchi, when I make my next batch of kimchi, what I'll often do is not wait till I'm done with the previous batch. And I'll add the previous kimchi, whatever's left, say I have a cup of it left over. I'll add that to the next batch that I make. And if you've ever made sourdough, that's sort of standard procedure for, for sourdough. So you save some of the starter, which contains the very active yeast and, and microbes which cause the reproduction which causes the bread to expand it's a similar process similar concept with the uh, with the kimchi it already contains a colony of microbes so it's just kind of a head start um, with all the ingredients in the jar rather than ferment in the traditional way meaning 
you know, buried, buried outside. Uh, in modern Korea, people would ha might have actually a, a kimchi refrigerator, which is kept at a different temperature, um, probably a slightly higher temperature than their, their main refrigerator. Um, a quick way to sort of get a head, a head start on it, you could, well, you could leave it in the fridge for about three weeks and it will start to ferment and it will slowly gain, um, gain the fermentation, the complete fermentation that you're looking for. If you want to give it a little head start, I often leave it on the counter just overnight uh, for two nights. And that seems to really, that seems to really get it going. Um, I will make a suggestion, which is when you have your ingredients in your vessel, whether you have it on the counter or, or in the fridge, I would urge you um, to put it on a plate and to not fill the vessel to the top. Use something big enough that you can leave maybe 20% roughly of airspace within the vessel because it will kind of bubble, which will cause all of this to expand a little bit, but then it's going to be releasing sort of liquid and, and it might flow up a tiny bit. Um, if the lid is very tight and it's a plastic vessel, you might get sort of pressurized expressions. If it's uh, seated but not tight, it will hold in a percentage of the pressure, which will then uh, help contain the effervescence. Um, and if it's completely uncapped, you will retain minimal effervescence, of course. But whatever happens, if you put it on a plate, you're going to be happy with that decision because often liquid will run down the side and it's either on your counter or in your fridge. And when something in your home is fermented, it's no secret until it's tightly capped. Um, so that's, that's what I've got so far for kimchi. Are there any questions? I have a question. Do you sure have do. to worry, do you have to worry about it going bad? Um, like I know we made yogurt once and I tried it another time and it went bad. Um, Oh. Yes, so I haven't had any go bad for me, and it's a bit of a silly question. When I was in culinary school, I asked, uh, I asked an instructor, how do you know when blue cheese goes bad? And everybody thought I was kidding, but really I wasn't. I just, I actually didn't like blue cheese, and it seemed like it's already moldy and a bit ripe smelling, so how would you know uh, when it went bad? But in this case, this will not get slimy like, like an egg white. If you have pickles that develop a slime, and cheese will develop a slime, and um, but just about anything that spoils will eventually develop a slime if it's you know, not necessarily a liquid. But it gets that kind of egg white, you know, when you pull one piece, it, there's a strand of liquid. Um, I think then it's probably time to move on. But it will last, especially if you keep it, once you put it in the fridge, uh, it should last months, months. And if it's salty enough, it could be a year. Same with yogurt. Um, I found a container of yogurt in a refrigerator somewhere I worked that was six months past the sell-by date, and it was fine. Um, there's something about the culture that once it's rich enough within the contained environment that what the food used to be is almost no longer relevant. It's now its own, it's now its own thing. And if you treat the, for lack of a better term, the bacteria uh, in such a way that it maintains the bacteria's health, then the food isn't as much of a concern because so much of it has been converted into uh, this bacteria, if that makes sense. Does, um, and by, by all means, someone jump in if they have another question. Um, if someone were going to go to the next step, like this was pretty like 
basic. And I think when people sit like here fermented, um, it can be kind of a, a, like a scary, not for everyone, but like, it's like, oh, I don't know if I like it, but this is pretty basic. This, What's that? Fermentation done with a specific result is extremely advanced. For example, making beer or wine is not easy. Well, I'll take that back. Making beer or wine is incredibly easy. People have did it on accident for thousands of years. But if you want a nice wine or a nice beer, uh, that takes a lot of experience and knowledge and specific parameters as to temperature, pressure, time, etc. cetera. Um, but to get something to ferment, enough salt will keep it from spoiling before it ferments. Then the fermenting helps to preserve it beyond that. Um, if someone wanted to take fermentation to the next level and sort of try things like, I've seen pickled sweet potato. To me, things that are starchy are a little more complicated. Um, that's something you can find recipes for and something you probably have to be a little more precise about uh, temperature and time mm -hmm. um, because they tend to spoil differently than something without starch would spoil because the starch within the vegetable is easily converted into sugar for the, uh, for the yeast to eat and it reacts at a different rate in a different, slightly different way. Mm -hmm. And of course, by no means any kind of expert on fermentation, but fermentation has become very popular in the past five or 10 years. So there are a lot of, a lot of cookbooks, a lot of uh, online resources. Uh, some friends of mine converted their, a closet in their kitchen to a fermentation closet and they were able to sort of maintain a steady temperature and they're really diligent about timing um, and they had a fair bit of success. Some things didn't come out, um, but it's, if it's something you're interested in, like most things, I think just go for it, try it, you know, start with, start with a little bit of research, whether that's a recipe or whether it's someone, you know, someone you know who's, who's tried a few things and absolutely go for it. If you wind up something inedible, you've gained a little bit of knowledge in at least what not to do or what didn't work. And, um, you know, a head of cabbage is a pretty, pretty minimal investment. And again, I'm using, you know, a used coconut oil jar, uh, salad spinner, cutting board. It's not, it's not heavy investment on equipment either. Unless you really have something specific and you're really, uh, really advanced, but, you know, start slow, dip a toe in it, see what you think. Well, I think that's it. Uh, Ganem, do you have anything to add before we wrap up? Uh, nothing to add other than thank you for joining me. This was fun. And I uh, hope, hope you guys give it a shot. <laughs>